Welcome, one and all, to what some say is the greatest show on earth, SESC 681 seminar. It's nice to be out of the deep freeze and have some power, although my office this morning was mighty cold due to some air conditioning malfunctioning. But, you know, let's, let's forget about that. We've got two great speakers lined up today, and our first speaker, I believe, is going to be introduced by... Dr. Smith, would you like to do the honors? I would, would welcome the opportunity. It is a uh, privilege to introduce uh, Allie Ulrich uh, to you folks. Uh, most of you know her, but she uh, uh, came to us from Sam Houston State University a few years ago. She did a summer internship with me and then joined our program to complete a master's degree working with an interspecific population uh, and an intraspecific population, primarily uh, identifying distribution of uh, uh, exceptional fiber length and fiber strength uh, in those populations. And then she has uh, stayed with us for her PhD that she's going to visit with you about today where she is, is uh, looking for uh, alleles uh, that, that have been... Uh, uh, left behind, if you will, in obsolete varieties, uh, alleles that will contribute to uh, additional fiber quality in upland cotton, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, genes uh, that we already have captured or fixed. So with Allie, with, with that, Allie, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Smith. Hopefully everyone can hear me just fine. Let me share my screen with you all. So once again, I am Alexandra Ulrich and today I will be presenting to you the utilization of obsolete germplasm for the improvement of upland cotton. So just a little bit of background on cotton itself. The majority of the cotton fiber that we grow here in the United States is exported overseas to uh, areas such as China and India for spinning and actual manufacturing. So the cotton that we provide out to the world has to compete on a global market. The fibers that we send over are spun and produced into various fabrics and the fabric fineness and quality that can be uh, produced is highly dependent on the thread fineness and uh, cotton qualities. So, those qualities are a variety of things, including such things as yellowness, the amount of uh, debris that is in the fiber itself. And of course, the most important ones are uh, fiber strength, fiber length, and fineness. But here in the Cotton Improvement Lab, we largely focus on uh, length and strength as they are upper half mean length and uh, fiber bundle strength. Introducing a background on my project itself, so the genetic diversity is narrowed by selection. Just any kind of process where you have to select a trait will eventually, regardless of the trait in question, will kind of narrow diversity, even in our non-target traits. So Gossypium pursutum, that is upland cotton, is typically grown as an inbred, meaning that unlike a crop such as corn, we don't have large heterotic groups. And that is a, another, uh, way that we tend to lose a lot of our genetic variety. So fiber traits themselves are generally additive or treated as additive anyway, because they are grown as inbreds. And so despite the fact that they are additive, however, they are highly quantitative for both of the traits that we're targeting. So both length and strength. So because they are highly quantitative, they have, tend to have anyway, a several large impact loci or alleles, and then a bunch of smaller impact loci. And that can mean that the smaller impact loci are masked by the bigger ones. So if we are breeding towards a longer fiber, we will select the plants with, with longer fibers. And those bigger alleles, those bigger impact loci will be fixed first. And oftentimes that ends up leaving the smaller loci fixed in a poor state or with the poor genetic diversity. So it's harder to find Better, uh, better alleles that can move towards improving the trait. 
So because we're leaving a lot of that genetic diversity behind, we are constantly searching for new sources of genetic diversity. And a lot of times we might look towards wild accessions or unadapted cultivars, but those require a lot of pre-breeding efforts, which again, cost time and money. So even though they have a lot of genetic variation that comes with good and bad things, so they might have some uh, alleles for improved fiber quality. However, they might have very poor uh, growing seasons. Like they might have a very long growing season, which isn't possible or can't be provided here in the areas we need them to grow. And so we have to put more effort into kind of integrating them before they can even be used in our populations themselves. There is a uh, variety or a species that is not quite a wild accession anymore, that is G. barbadensi. It is a high fiber quality and a lot of people might know it as Pima cotton. You'll see it uh, tagged on high quality shirts because the fibers of it are tend to be very long and strong and very fine. So you can produce very high quality fabrics with it. Unfortunately, however, as with the wild accessions, they tend to have very low yields and do require those really long growing periods, which can make them difficult to use here in Texas where we don't have those things available. And of course, they still require a lot of pre-breeding in, in an attempt to move them into our Gisipium hirsutum populations because they have difficulty integrating genetically. They had, tend to have large linkage blocks. So when you are integrating them into a hirsutum population, the progeny of them tend to segregate back out instead of having an even mixture of the quality traits we're looking for. So because of those difficulties in using wild accessions or these barbadensi cultivars, a lot of times er, we might look towards obsolete cultivars that can be found within the, you know, or the USDA gene banks. And those can be integrated more easily as a source of useful diversity which is what my project wanted to focus on. So I had four main objectives, uh, two of which I will focus on today. So the first one was to cross these obsolete cultivars found within the USDA gene bank with our modern representative parent in order to identify potential sources of positive alleles for fiber traits in Gisipium hirsutum. And my second objective, which I'll show, is to observe fiber quality distributions in a subset of my segregating F2 lines. Objectives three and objective four, I hope to eventually characterize some gene action of the using generation means analysis. And objective four is to kind of coalesce all of this together as and produce a model which would help us more easily identify these obsolete lines without having to go through as much of a breeding process which slows things down. But starting off with objective one, that is my line by tester. I have two parents. Uh, my first parent is a representative parent that is a TAM B182-33 extra long staple upland, which is representative of our TAM cotton improvement lab lines. These are elite fiber. Uh, it is an elite fiber line and it is competitive with many of our commercial varieties. The ELSU does stand for extra long staple upland and it's something that has been developed over time and has a fiber length that is higher than a lot of the commercial varieties. My second parent consists of 120, 127 different cultivars. 93 were sourced from the USDA germplasm, while 34 were actually internal to our CIL. Of those 34, 12 are related lines to our representative parent. Those are TAM lines and they are also elite fiber quality. And then 22 of those are actually intraspecific. That is a barbadensi and hirsutum cross that was uh, produced by one of our previous grad students. And so we wanted to include these internal lines as a comparison to the uh, older obsolete lines to see how they differ in genetic diversity and how they can add into our populations. For my methods, again, it's a line by tester. I had three locations, uh, two reps in, uh, that is over three years. So that's Westlaco, Corpus Christi, and College Station. The F2 parent pairs were randomized together in each of the locations. And then within each of the two reps, there are four TAM B182-33 lines included. 
Then there's also an amount of F1 data that you'll see here shortly, and that was in, collected in two different locations during 2017. For the harvesting of the rows, each row had a 30 bowl hand sample gathered. And then each of those samples were hand ginned on a single sample lab gen. Uh, those samples were then collected into Search Institute in Lubbock, Texas for HVI testing, which is high volume instrumentation, which is a very common lab test used to quantify different fiber qualities. And then the data was further analyzed in JUMP. So just as a preliminary look, this is all of the lines sorted by length. So over here on our left, we have those with the longest fiber and on the right, we have those with the shortest fiber. So the gold lines or the gold dots represent our TAM elites. Those are the ones most closely related to our representative parent. And the green dots represent the KH interspecific, interspecifics. The blue lines, which are the ones that we are most interested in, those are the USDA obsolete germplasm. So the uh, X axis here is simply the upper half mean length by rank. And then the actual fiber upper half mean length is here on our y axis. If you look at our distribution here, you'll find that a lot of our TAM elites and our interspecifics gather towards the higher ranked varieties. That means they tended to have a longer fiber length. And if we were looking specifically at just increasing or breeding by traditional means, we might select these as integration into our populations as in order to increase those fiber properties as fast as possible. However, that's not entirely what we're looking for. We want to go back to these USDA lines and see if we can find enough genetic diversity that could be added into our lines. And so that brings us to our next graph here. Now on our x-axis, we still have our mid-parent upper half mean length and our y-axis is the F2 upper half mean lengths. The uh, key is the same. So we have our gold are our TAM elites, the greens are our KH interspecifics, and the blue are still our USDA lines that we're most interested in. Now it's important to note that the line here does not represent a uh, regression line. It is simply the line on which the dots or F2 dots would fall on if they uh, were completely additive gene action there. So, as you can see, our KH interspecifics and our uh, tamblete still gathered towards having the highest fiber length. However, they do fall below our uh, purely additive line. So because the dots do not fall on this line, we can see that there must be some more complex gene action uh, in going on in our background here. And so the lines that fall above or the cotton varieties that fall above this line, those are ones that show a uh, genetic background that increased uh, our fiber properties versus what we would have expected. So uh, most of our elites and our interspecifics fall below this line, meaning that they actually perform slightly worse than they, we would have expected them to perform if they had only been involved with additive gene action. And so most of our TAM elites do fall below this line, which is expected considering that they're highly related to our representative parent. And most of our green lines also do fall below this line. There are a several that do come above, which are interesting and not unexpected considering that they should be more diverse than our TAM elites. However, looking at them in the field, I can definitely tell you that they have very poor yield in general and you would have to work with them quite a bit in order to uh, introduce them into our populations. Now, our USDA lines, the ones that we are most interested in, we do have a variety and a body of them do fall below our line. However, there are a number that fall above this line and there are several of which perform very well. And these are the ones that we are most interested in. And these are the ones that we really wanna look at going forward as a way to improve our populations. And these are just naming a couple of those. Our best performer there is Storm King TPSA number one, but we also have our Maeda Clean Seeds and our Dixie Triumphs and a number of others. 
So this graph is identical to the one you just saw. However, the only thing that's changed here is how I've color coded them. So rather than being color coded by their uh, original population, they are color coded by the F1 data I told you about earlier. So the color represents the difference between the F1 and the parent upper half mean length. So the darker the green, that means it performed better as an F1 versus the red dots, which performed very poorly as an F1. So you'll notice that the Storm King TPSA number one still performed admirably as an F1. And there are a number that performed very poorly as an F1. The thing I want you guys to take away from this graph is that the dots that are red tended to maintain their poor performance as an F2, which means that we can actually make selections very early in our F1 lines and simply eliminate those instead of carrying them onward to our F2 population, which is a drain on a resource. So it just allows us to make those uh, selections even earlier in our population and continue onward as quickly as possible. So in, in summary for our objective one, we identified a number of promising lines. The differences between our F1s and F2 performance indicate that there is a, the presence of non-additive gene action, which could interfere with modeling or predictive capabilities. And the further objectives hope to account for some of that non-additive variation. Moving onward to our objective two, we wanted to observe fiber quality distribution in a subset of F2s and their respective inbred parents, and then further examine how those uh, F2 segregate for selection purposes. So for our materials, I had four selected lines. Those were selected on the basis of general good and poor line or fiber quality. That's DPL 5690 and Paymaster 792 were selected because they had, had poor both length and strength. And then RN 96527 and Delta Pi 90 were selected based on having good strength. And of course, remained within those selections. And then along with these parent lines, their F2s were also uh, harvested for this. For the methodology, we used the same materials as the line by testers. After those 30 bolts row samples were taken, we went back into those same rows. And instead of harvesting just a general 30 bolt sample, we harvested each individual plant and the fiber from that was kept separate so that we can analyze each plant individually. And that is both from the parent and the F2s. This was not done here in Corpus or in College Station. So this was only done in Corpus Christi and in Westlaco. And then all the parent lines and the corresponding F2s were harvested, all uh, mature bowls. And then they were sent off and ginned the exact same as our previous lines were from our line by tester. So for this, all the individual plants, we just did a general uh, analysis of variation on them to show how the uh, variances between the F2s and the parent lines different or differentiated. And we wanted to also to compare the variance between the high performing lines and the low performing lines. As expected, and I haven't shown it here, but uh, the parental lines in the F2s did have a uh, significant variation, amount of variation between the two. The parental lines tended to have a lower amount of variation as you would expect considering they should be inbred. And so the variation between plants should be more down to simple error and the difference between the lower growing bulls and higher growing bulls versus the F2s, which should be segregating at that point. So you should be seeing a higher amount of variation between plants. Here for the strength, we did see a very similar uh, uh, trend. However, there was a, a bit less of a difference between the F2s and their parents. This is probably due to how the strength differs. Uh, there tends to be a more variation within the fiber lengths as compared to the uh, as compared to the fiber strength. And so looking at both of these together, it kind of confirms what we already knew that there is quite a bit of variance. 
So for our ongoing analysis, I have the generation means analysis data, which still needs to be analyzed. I had hoped to do that previously last week. However, there were some complications with the weather. So unfortunately, I was not able to present that data here for you today. But continuing on forward, I hope to get that analyzed as well as consolidate all of this information together to continue onward with the project. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Smith, Dr. Schumann, Dr. He Kay, the USDA, and of course, everyone else working in the USDA lab, or not the USDA, the CIL, as well as Cotton Incorporated and Texas A&M AgriLife. And with that, I'd like to take any questions you might have. Good job. Great job, Alexandra. Questions? I'll go. Um, Allie, did you use a HBI or did you go through APHIS for all your data? I actually, I did use HBI and I had access to APHIS for a while. And for those who don't know, APHIS is a, uh, another way of analyzing cotton fiber, which takes a look at individual fibers rather than fiber bundles like H or HVI does. So you get a lot more data out of it and you can look at a variety of different traits. However, it is quite a bit more expensive and considering the number of uh, samples I had to deal with, we figured HVI was easier to work with. Other questions? Don't be shy. So Allie, do you think that you have found some uh, alleles that will assist in the program's effort to uh, further improve uh, fiber length? Well, I can't say that I've specifically found individual alleles itself because we aren't targeting True. alleles at that kind of specific level. I would definitely say that I found some lines that could contain alleles and uh, novel diversity that could definitely be integrated easily into our program. Do you recall uh, uh, when some of those uh, old uh, varieties, those obsolete cultivars that you noted, uh, do you recall the year of their, their release, such as Storm King TSPA or whatever it was? Off the top of my head, I can't give you an exact year, but I do know that a number of them were from the early 1900s, and there might have been one from the late 1800s, but I can't recall which one it was. Well, I just I'll just share with the rest of the group that that they do go back to the to the 1930s or so, 30s or so. Uh, the the Meads, the Storm King, uh, don't recall the others, but they come out of the 1930s and 40s, half and half. You did have some lines such as half and half in your work that went back to 1906, uh, but uh, Hartsfield probably goes back into the 19. 30s, New Boinkin. PD1 is probably in the 1960s. Delta Pine 50 is 1980s. Mead Clean Seed, that goes back to the early part of the 19th, or the 20th century. Uh, Dixie Triumph and Wyndham Acres, uh, again, uh, coming off of the East Coast, and they come out of the, the 1930s or so, as I recall. But just wanted to, to take the opportunity to, to uh, make a point to the, the other graduate students and other folks in the, in the seminar that uh, uh, the National Plant Germplasm System is a great uh, resource uh, uh, and is a real uh, uh, treasure uh, for uh, agriculture to be able to go back and have all of this information, this genetic information remaining available to us. Yes, very much. Thank you for that addition. Uh, More questions? I have a quick question. Um, so I'm not very familiar with plant breeding. Would it be possible to go over the line by tester method a little bit more? Oh, yes, my apologies. So effectively, I had the representative parent. And so for the line by tester, you take that representative parent and you cross it to each one of our 127 cultivars. And then in the field, you plant the parent and the progeny side by side. And so when you are taking your data samples because they're next to each other, it's easy to compare them. 
and you've got a your representative parent scattered throughout the field as well. So as an additional data point to look at. Thank you. Of course. More questions? I have a question. Um, I, I yes, didn't catch course. it earlier. Um, yeah, I didn't catch it earlier if you specifically said, but are you taking these to yield or are you just looking at fiber alone? These were just fiber alone. Uh, yield itself is difficult considering that we don't have very much of them and it's it's not a good representation of what you would be looking at for yield, considering that in cotton yield is generally a, a very late generation selected trait. And so looking at the yield of an F2 or an F1 isn't necessarily useful, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. And, and there's a negative correlation between those two also, right? As far as lint mm -hmm. yield and fiber fiber quality, fiber strength? They don't necessarily have a negative correlation. I know that we had a previous master's student who did look at that. If you are selecting for both of them at the same time, you don't necessarily get a negative correlation. However, if you highly focus on one of the traits, you tend to ignore yield a little bit, but it can be kept around if you try hard enough. And, and as far as your modeling, what? you mentioned that you're going to try to create a model. What kind of model are you looking at? Are you looking at trying to do something where you take, you know, with all the data mining ability, can you take historical data and combine it with your genetic data and, and, and develop a model that could do some predictions for you? Uh, I failed to mention it, my apologies, but the USDA does have an amount of genetic data for these uh, lines. And so my hope is that by looking at some of the differences in uh, genetic variation and the differences between the complex gene actions that we hope to look at with the GMA, that we can kind of make a basic model that could predict the uh, what we were looking at with the differences in actual versus expected performance and see if we can't kind of produce a seeded population that can kind of get rid of some of these uh, poor acting lines early before we actually even have to plant them. Thanks. Yes, I think I've got a question in chat. So yes, Jeffrey Siegfried asks, do you think upland fiber that can be grown here will ever match the quality of Pima? Dr. Smith could probably give a better explanation if I do a poor job here, but we do actually have some lines that are nearly comparable with the lower quality Pimas. I can't give a general average range for Pima, but we did have several uh, planted varieties in our fields last year that I think got up to 1.6 or 1.65 inch in length, which is extremely good for an upland variety. Dr. Smith, do you have anything to add there? Well, I will, I will, I will merge uh, Jeff's question with uh, Megan's, uh, and that is that uh, could we produce an upland type, uh, a Gossypium hirsutum with Pima type quality? The answer is probably yes, but would we suffer the same issue, and that is reduced yield potential on a more global scale? So. Pima will produce well where it's adapted in the southwestern United States, uh, but it won't go, it, it won't yield uh, if you move it out of that environment and move it across the, the, the cotton belt. That's the reason upland has grown on 95% of our acreage. So I think we've demonstrated that, that, that we can make progress toward producing an upland that has improved fiber length, fiber strength, fiber fineness, uh, that we, we are not approaching, but, but we are closer to producing the quality of yarn with these upland types as we produce with Pima. But we are, at this point in time, we are sacrificing yield potential. 
and whether or not we can ever uh, uh, put those things together and uh, with, with yield that we get out of upland today, the type of uplands we grow, it most likely would depend on whether or not there is economic pressure to do so. Until the industry demands more quality fibers, uh, private industry that produces the, all of the varieties that we grow in the United States, they're, they're not going to spend time trying to produce those kind of varieties, uh, that kind of quality with, with that kind of yield. Uh, so so uh, economics comes into play. What you can do and what you will do uh, are usually two different things. Thank you, Dr. Smith.